Welcome back to the Novelty Podcast. My name is Alexandra and I read from the perspective of basically your annoying English teacher in high school. And my name is Emily and I have a background in writing and editing, so that's the perspective I read from, which can also be somewhat annoying when I'm just like, okay, but people don't talk like that. <laughs> yeah. So we kind of think of it as I think about what the reader owes the book. And I think about what the reader needs to give to the writer as like you have a responsibility to, if you're writing a novel, first you write a novel, then you can talk about all the things you want to talk about. <laughs> right. So today we have a really favorite pet topic of both of ours, which is Agatha Christie. <laughs> <laughs> which I'm basically like evangelistic about. Yeah. Like my husband and I describe our marriage as like a seven year discussion about pa Patrick O'Brien and Agatha Christie because I don't <laughs> stop talking about Agatha Christie. It's true. It's, she's like, it's true. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I, I had read several of Agatha Christie's novels before, but I, because of your passion for her and how much you shared about her, I got so much more interested and have embarked on the project of reading all of her works, which you've already done. Yeah, I think more I'm, than once. I several of them I've read more than once. I think I only have like one left. That I've haven't read, mm -hmm. which she, during her lifetime between short stories and novels, wrote over a hundred stories. Right. So it's, it's a serious endeavor. Yeah. <laughs> and then it turns out that she's just a fascinating individual in her own right. So if you guys have the opportunity to either check out or read or listen to a bi biography on Agatha Christie, I just finished a good one that was um, written by... Uh, Lucy Worsley. I'll have it linked down below. And it was an excellent, excellent biography. She has a really, really fascinating life. We're going to focus on her works and her literature today. Um, but her we'll life is very interesting. Yeah. And that does show up in her work quite frequently. Yeah. So I can definitely recommend that one to you guys. Okay. So let's dive in with our first <laughs> Poirot investment. Okay. Tell us about this book in this edition. Actually, um, so I got this on the, my first trip to London. Um, there's a bookstore there that's literally four stories and has been in business, I think, for 300 years now. Mm -hmm. um, so it was, it's like a mecca. But they had a collection of Agatha Christie's where they reprinted them with the original covers that they were printed with at the time. Yeah. Um, so this was the original Poirot Investigates with this really fabulous photograph of what Poirot is supposed to look like. He's and I truly I, dapper. Gentleman. He's a very, and that's an excellent mustache, let's yeah. all be honest, because he had the greatest mustache in England. Right. I think actually. Poirot's vanity is just such a key characteristic that, you know, you, you gotta love him. You, you gotta, gotta love him, him, and you gotta love Hastings' commentary <sighs> on the vanity. <laughs> right. Okay, well, let's dive into some of the topics, which, like, oh, right, we gotta talk about our tea. We gotta talk about our tea. So what do you have? What are you drinking? I am drinking Harney and Sons' Death on the Nile. I am drinking Harney and Sons' Murder on the Orient Express. Which... This is what I really love about Harney and Sons. They're not just like putting black tea in and being like, it's good. This one is like chamomile and then a bunch of like extra herbs on it. So it's mm. kind of supposed to be like a little Middle Eastern in its flavor. Oh. Whereas Murder on the Orient Express is a much harder black tea with like a little gunpowder to it. Oh, nice. So yeah, yeah. Harney and Sons, they're coming through for us. That's right. And, and if you're wondering, oh, was that on purpose? Yes. Yes. Yes, it was. <laughs> okay, so now we can get into the topics. So one of the things that I find really, really interesting about Agatha Christie as a writer, as opposed to what we frequently see with many famous Thank authors, others. is that really she's famous for her work as a whole, for her whole canon, her whole body right, of work. Right, right. There's not like, oh, this is her famous book. And then like all of her other books are great, but never, like yeah. certain authors, like you associate one book with them. And then yeah. you later on find out they actually wrote a whole bunch of other things. Yeah. But Agatha Christie, no, it's true. Like you can read all of her works and it's completely acceptable to me when a person's like, oh, her Poirots are my favorite or her Miss Marples are her favorite or mm -hmm. the standalones are my favorite. Because like, honestly, there's excellent works in all of those collections. Yeah, and I think, you know, part of it is that she's very consistent in her quality. So yeah. there isn't really anything that, from what I've read so far, which I've read quite a few of her books, not as many as you have, where it's like, oh, this really is a standout novel that's head and shoulders in quality or in interest above the others. Um, she's just an extremely consistent writer from her early career to the end. We do see improvements in like complexity coming in, but from the get, she's really good. She is, and she took it very, very seriously. Like this is the golden age of mystery. So there's like a ton of mystery writers that are coming out of this era. Mm -hmm. um, 
And like I've kind of like done some research and read up on a lot of other, or read the pieces by a lot of other Golden Age writers, and that's like a fascinating just exploration into that writing style. Mm -hmm. But she stands out very, very much in this group, and I think that's in part because she took this very seriously, and this was like her one thing. Mm -hmm. A lot of the other Golden Age mystery writers had like other jobs and other passions, and, and mystery writing was something they did either to like earn money or just for fun, whereas Christy was like, no, this is my thing. Yeah, it's very clear, you know, it's, it's interesting re from the sort of biographical perspective of her, because she never really conceived of herself as a working author. She often called herself a housewife whenever anybody asked her what her profession was or if she had to write it down. Um, she was married um, to two different gentlemen. And, Not but, at the same time. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. She, was, she got divorced and had a second marriage. Um, but, she, but at the same time, it's so clear that she treats her writing with a level of professionalism, that she would you know, really sit down and do the work in a very professional way, would have dedicated hours and times, would be, and that's part of why her canon is so huge, is she was a very productive writer. writer yeah. yeah. I feel like one of the most important moments in her writing was when her first husband left her, yeah. and she still had a writing contract, and she needed to produce books. And she talked about like that was the moment she felt like she truly became a professional because she didn't want to do anything at that mm -hmm. time era except for just like hide in her bedroom. Yeah. But she still got up every day and wrote that book that she was under contract for. And she talks about how like that was the moment where she personally felt she went from an amateur to a professional because yeah. she wrote no matter what. Yeah. And I, and I think that's a really good marker for anybody who's an aspiring writer out there is like or artist of any kind do you show up to the page or the canvas or yeah you know the piano or whatever it is that you're working on with or without inspiration Ration. or the yeah. desire to be creative in whether or not you feel like doing this or not you're yeah. just going to do it and you're going to keep and she's like kind of it's kind of funny because i forget which novel that was that she produced at that time but she was like oh it's my worst novel and everyone's like it's really not yeah but she just has a lot of negative feelings mm -hmm. about like that whole process but it's yeah. still to her was so important that she finished that book no matter how negative she felt that yeah. I feel like that was probably like a really, really important, like how we ended up, I guess, with the vast number of books because that was the moment where she was like, I will not stop doing this for anything. Yeah. And even when she was like extremely successful in her career, cause she made quite a bit of money throughout her career, you know, and had not only just was widely published in her own time and appreciated, she also had like movie contracts with MGM. She also had, you know, all, all kinds of merchandising kind of around She her. wrote several plays. Mm -hmm. One of them is the longest running play in history. Yeah. The Mousetrap has been in production since the moment it was originally produced. Mm -hmm. There's actually a standing contract on that, that the minute it goes out of the theater, it will be made into a film. Oh, wow. And it's never gone out of the theater. <laughs> uh, well, we will have to still wait and look forward to that film. Um, and I think, you know, even when she's making a lot of money, she's still very consistently, again, setting aside that time. And she would kind of have like her working time of the year and then often take the summers to kind of have this vacation. One of the things that I really like about Agatha Christie that came through in the biography that I read about her is how much of a sort of like, she just had a real zest for life and enjoyment she of did. life. Yeah. She really enjoyed hosting people. She was kind of like this adoptive mother figure for a lot of people. She liked having her friends and her people around her. She really enjoyed food. So she would often talk about like as she got older and like gained weight and stuff of like, you know, her wanting to lose weight, but not really wanting right. to give up the food. Yeah, and like that much. <laughs> totally worth it, you know, at the end of the day. And, you know, and she even in her romantic relationships, which she was very much in love with her first husband, although that was a painful divorce. And then she kind of had the second romance later in life with actually a much younger man. And even in the letters that they shared back and forth, you know, she had just a, a, a joy in the intimacy of their relationship too that came through in a really, you know, just sincere and raw way that I think is really... I, I just enjoy that about her so much. I think, yeah, one of the pieces of her that makes that possible is she never like kind of bought into her own hype no matter how yeah. big she was in her lifetime which like let's recall in her lifetime when she finally released the book in which Poirot dies that was literally front page news on London newspaper so like she yeah. was huge but she never really like thought of herself as like oh I'm gonna be this long lasting writer she like seriously believed that after her death her books would fall into obscurity and we wouldn't be reading them anymore yeah and like she's still hitting like genre best-selling list to this day. Yeah. So she just never really saw herself the way like the rest of the world saw her. Yeah, which that's a really important point too. She's still one of the most sold, most translated 
kind of behind the Bible, her canon of works. Yeah, I think she's actually the best-selling novelist of all times. Yeah. Which I don't feel like we like realize that a female writer is the best-selling novelist of all time. Yeah. And currently she's like only outsold by the Bible and Shakespeare, yeah. which they did kind of have a head start on her. Yeah. So. <laughs> yeah. And um, so she's just, you know, this amazing f- figure in history, history, <laughs> figure in history. She's had this really interesting life. And she left us with this huge legacy of literature to enjoy. So let's talk a little bit about her contemporaries and maybe people who would want to poke holes in our admiration for Christy. Yeah, I think... Does that that, hold water, in your opinion? I feel like there's kind of a... um, Who are the two other big players? So there's a kind of a contrarian view right now that... Um, Dorothy L. Sayers and Niall Marsh should be like the attention getters in this genre which like I'm going to take a moment and say like how cool is it that the three biggest writers from this time are all female yeah you know I think that's actually really good um, I also think that like Dorothy L. Sayers and Niall Marsh both did produce really interesting books and should definitely be read in terms of like mystery writing they really really do not hold up to Agatha Christie's just like level of writing. Yeah. I mean, Dorothy Sayers is a a good writer. Like she's just a very very solid writer, and she writes about some really interesting topics. Whose body has a very interesting perspective on anti-Semitism and British culture um, post World War One, and I think it's really worth reading. But when it comes to being like a mystery writer, she's like, here are my suspects, and you're like, well, that's the killer right there. Like, you. You're not doing, like, we're not hiding this. Like, this is right there, you know? Yeah. And to me, that's, like, where Christy surpasses it for, for her. Because, like, with Christy, you're, like, down to the last chapter. Like, wait. But what the? about the, but could it? <laughs> and then when the reveal happens, you're like, well, I should have seen that yeah. coming. <laughs> and I feel like the same is with Niall Marsh. Like, she writes some really interesting books, um, especially something like Color Scheme. Mm-hmm. It has a really interesting perspective because she's actually from New Zealand. Mm-hmm. And so it's really a novel more about what New Zealand went through during mm-hmm. World War II, which I feel like is something we never even really think about. Mm-hmm. But also, like, a lot of her mystery plots are fairly implausible. <laughs> um, I think for her very first one, like, I'm, sitting there, I'm reading this, I'm like, how is it possible for this murder to be committed? Like, what you're laying out for me is not really possible. And the solution was, like, in, like, a 30-second power outage, this guy strips down to his underwear, goes down a banister, stabs someone, and runs upstairs, and it's like, no, he didn't. <laughs> like, no. <laughs> so I still think they're very worth reading, but to the people who are like, oh, no, we should be paying attention to these authors and not Christie, like, that's not legitimate to me, because... First and foremost, these books are presenting themselves as mysteries, Mm -hmm. and so they need to first and foremost function well as mysteries, and Christy far outpaces anyone in her class in that section. Yeah, and I think, you know, I do find these types of contrarian positions very interesting, because even though I have, you know, I have my personal favorites, and I have my own sort of judgment of what I think makes a quality book or not, and a lot of these things, let's just be honest about it, at the end of the day are subjective. Yeah. So it's, it's about your taste. So you're welcome to your own opinion, by all means. We're not trying to convince you, you otherwise yeah, or whatever. If you like Niall Marsh better, go that, for it. that's completely fine. Yeah. But I do find it interesting when someone says, well, you shouldn't like Agatha Christie better. You could put her beneath these other yeah. authors, you know. Because it's sort of like, well, you know, there's, you're kind of, there's kind of millions and millions of people since like the 1930s on who have been like, who have had the um, opposite opinion. So I think there's a certain amount of hubris well, let us say. And I also feel like history is a good test of time. There's a reason why Agatha Christie is widely known and Agatha Christie's, you know, books have lived on mm-hmm. so long and have so many films made out of them, TV shows made out of them, we're still reading them. Yeah. And whereas like Sayers and Marsh are more obscure writers yeah. who are more known in the people who like that genre. Yeah. And I feel like his that like moments like that, history is like kind of telling you the truth of like right. the difference between those quality of writing. Yeah, and I think the the more interesting question for me is to actually approach it with curiosity and say, okay, well, what is it about Agatha Christie or Jane Austen or Charles Dickens or Shakespeare? What What? is the quality about these things that make them so enduring, that make them so resonant with people across time? Why we keep coming back to them. Why they're rereadable. You know, you can... For me, even though like the Agatha Christie's are based around like a whodunit and like once you've had it spoiled, you've had it spoiled, they're still extremely rereadable for me. And I think a lot of that comes down to her characterization, which we should talk about. But one more comment on this topic of like how 
populism is still a, a, a legitimate question to investigate is like we can even look at things that like I think most people will agree are of low quality, you know, something like a Twilight or something like, even if you're into reality television, and yet it's so resonant. And so I think the much more interesting question is what makes Twilight compelling? What makes Vanderpump rules or The Bachelor compelling? Why are the, why do these things sort of capture the hearts and imaginations of people, yeah. even if they're not to my taste? Well, and one interesting aspect of that is also like, you know, Christy passed away in the 70s. In 2023, we're still reading her. Yeah. So it'd be interesting to see, like, 50 years from now, 60 years from now, are we still reading Twilight? Or are we just like, wait, what yeah. was that book called? You know, yeah. like, that also will be a test of, like, yes, yeah. there are moments in the sun for things, but Christy was, had, like, a moment in the sun, and that has not set. Yeah. Okay, so since I kind of blew past this, let's talk a little bit about Agatha Christie's writer, like quality as a novelist outside of her just being accomplished within her genre of mystery, which is like, she has amazing characters, she has amazing descriptions, people are unexpected, she doesn't work with tropes or stereotypes a lot of the time. What else do you see within her writing that makes it so quality? I feel like she really, really wrote from a ground level perspective in her own time era. Mm. So it's like very, she lives through like an incredible period in history. She's an active participant in World War One. She's an active participant in World War Two. She lives through a lot of the Cold War. Mm -hmm. So she's living for one thing at a really fascinating time in history. Yeah. And she just really, really wants to write from a perspective of like, uh, I, as the author, am in the middle of all this, and I'm going to show you exactly what's going on. Yeah. And these are just naturally interesting time periods yeah. in and of themselves. And so when you're sitting on ground level and you're seeing how people are living, how they're reacting to these time periods, how they're you know dealing with things, I think she's just so visceral in mm -hmm. writing what people were actually experiencing that, yeah. to me, that elevates it to a certain extent. What were some of the things that were maybe surprising for you as an American or as a modern reader that... Christie shed light on through her realism and her closeness to the people. Well, for me, like one of the biggest things was the post World War II era. Mm -hmm. um, those are actually like my favorite period of her writing. Um, I feel like from every time era she wrote, there's like good pieces. But my personal favorite is post World War II, and part of that is as an American, like I grew up with the history of post World War II America, which is obviously like a boom time. People are very right. prosperous. Families are very prosperous. It's like you know, one of like the high points of American yeah. history, which like by contrast, like we weren't occupied. We didn't have like, like the war was so far, far away, away from us that we didn't have like literal impacts on our land, on our country. We never like, you know, like Hawaii experienced like one attack, whereas like London's experiencing nightly attacks. Right. And so like, while I knew a lot of history about like what went on in Britain during World War Two, like I never really understood like the impact afterwards and just like day to day like food shortages and clothing shortages and you know the government would put a huge tax on everyone in the country in an attempt to like rebuild infrastructure and like you literally had people losing generational homes because they couldn't afford mm -hmm. and like ending up homeless mm -hmm. because they can't afford to pay these taxes that are a result of World War Two, and so it's like a devastating time in yeah. this history. Plus, you have, of course, rationing during the war, but you have rationing for a long term. For a long afterwards. term time afterwards. Yeah, like some of her books that are written in the like mid to late fifties. People are like, I can't bake you a birthday cake this year because we used all of our sugar rations already. You yeah. know, so it's like this was very very long term impacting, and then also. Um, it's like you see things in like um, the novel at Bertram's Hotel, which is mm -hmm. a Miss Marple, and Miss Marple's kind of going into London for the first time since the war, yeah. and going in and realizing how much of the London that she knew has just been got leveled, yeah. like it's gone, yeah. and she's trying to basically find the London that she knew, and it's a very melancholy book, which is kind of interesting for Christie. She does have those. She does mm -hmm. definitely have books that are more melancholy, and I do feel like this is like a very melancholy book, and the idea that like Miss Marple in her search for the London she once knew finally comes to the end of the novel and is like oh it's it's gone mm -hmm. the the London that I knew as a young woman the London I even knew as a middle-aged woman yeah. is gone and it's not coming back they can't yeah. rebuild it you know there's no way to resurrect both the buildings and the lifestyle the yeah. lifestyle is gone you know you see in like pre-world war ii Christie novels of people like 
you know, you come down to breakfast and there's like tons of food and you're having the full English breakfast. Post-World War II, you're coming down to breakfast and you're having a piece of toast. Right. You know, and everyone's like, oh, well, we don't even want to eat like that anymore. You can't digest that. And like this kind of living this life of like, we're just, get, we're just accepting this. We're moving right. on. We're not asking to go back. We're not fighting for it anymore. We're just moving forward. Yeah. What are some other titles that you would suggest to readers to pick up if they want to have some of those real world glimpses and insights baked into the story? Well, for the post-World War II era, um, my favorites are Taken at the Flood, which is kind of the story of one family in England and how what happened post-World War II is affecting each one, Mm -hmm. both from like the economic but also the psychological um, aspects. There's a really fascinating power dynamic in this one because one of the main characters is a young woman who um, joins the Wrens, which mm. is like they didn't see active combat, but they went into combat zones. Mm. And she is engaged to a man who was actually asked by the British government to stay home because he was a farmer and they really needed food. Mm-hmm. And so he misses out on action and she's seen action. And then they come back together after World War II and they like can't, they Make don't know how to like function. Mm-hmm. And it actually ends very darkly with that yeah. relationship. But I don't think she's necessarily like condoning how it ends but just being like this is how messed up we've become yeah. you know so that that's a really really fascinating novel it's a really excellent twist at the end too it's just like oh man you got me good <laughs> um uh, another one is appointment with murder which isn't necessarily my favorite but there are so many comments in there just like offhand comments that let you know what it was like to live in britain at this time that i find it fascinating yeah just from that in and of itself like that's just a really really interesting just like tiny little comments that come through is like people are reading the newspaper in the morning or, you know, people are trying to make dinner for themselves. Like just, it just is like kind of sprinkled all the way through what life was like. Slice of life component. Yeah, exactly. That's a village murder mystery. And so everything is very mundane, but like it's done in such an interesting way that you're just like, oh my God. (laughs) But what does it mean that he took two lumps of sugar? (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And then, so that gives us an insight into history, but it was really her contemporary life. She also has this really interesting look at that which was historical even for her because her second husband was an archaeologist, so she got to be on dig. She's very well informed because of her proximity to this. So what are some of the novels that kind of um, illuminate like archaeological history to us? My absolute favorite one is Murder in Mesopotamia, Mm -hmm. which I read because I read, so like, Basically, the story of how she met her second husband is she decided on her own to, like, get on a train and go see the world, which, really interesting choice for, like, a single woman in this time era. Yeah. And and she ends up meeting this, like, archaeological group, and one of the, like, the head archaeologist in the group she's with, wife, Mm -hmm. decides that she cannot travel by herself as a woman, and, like, demands that she be accompanied by the man who eventually, like, becomes her husband. And he's also an archaeologist on this day. He's sort of, like, the second in command or whatever. And so they're like, oh, we gotta, like, give, you know, it's Agatha Christie, gotta give her the tour. And so... In the biography, at least the way that they characterize it, is like perhaps he might have had some assumptions about what Agatha Christie was like, or mm-hmm. you know maybe she was going to be demanding or something like that. But she ended up being just a fascinating being person nice, to talk normal. to. Yeah, person. yeah, and and she was quite flexible. They had some, you know, they, it's like perfect for a romance novel. These little like hiccups where they're kind of like thrown together yeah, for yeah. hours at a time, and a car breaks down, and they have to like figure out how to go along, get up, get through it. And so, you know, and he ends up discovering what a wonderful person she was. Yeah, so Murder in Mesopotamia is actually based on that group. Mm -hmm. My, the reason I picked this one out at the time I read it was I had read that she like thoroughly and completely held a grudge against this woman saying that she wasn't allowed to travel by herself. So the novel is about her and she kills this woman. (laughs) (laughs) Which like, this is why you don't mess with murder mystery writers, okay? Like, that's what's gonna happen, you know? (laughs) So I just, I found that to be so entertaining. I was like, okay, I need to go find this one and read it. And that honestly has become one of my all-time favorites. I read that annually. Mm-hmm. Um, and on multiple levels, on the way Paro is involved in it, the narrator of that one is extremely unique for her. Um, but it also just gives you a really, really fascinating view of what it would have been like for, you know, the 
group of archaeologists to gather together to be, you know, for the season yeah. where they would have lived, what their living circumstances would have been like, yeah. um, what they were trying to do. Mm -hmm. But then also it creates like a perfect, like small community, which is where she, I think, functions the best because yeah. a lot of her mystery writing focuses around like psychology mm -hmm. and how that plays out in a small community, which yeah. is just scary and creepy, but yeah. also fabulous. Yeah, absolutely. Any other archaeology books that you would suggest? Um, they Came to Baghdad is really fascinating for the archaeological perspective because she's like talking about being on the um, dig site for Nebuchadnezzar's palace, mm -hmm. which that was always something really interesting and intriguing to me because like that's something that's gone now. Yeah. We don't have these things anymore. Um, I don't think it's the best mystery in the world, but just reading it for that alone was really fascinating. And, yeah. you know, I first read that during like the beginning of the Iraq war and you have like descriptions of Iraq where like British tourists are going and staying on hotels in the Euphrates river. And it's like, oh, this is different. You know, yeah. it's like a really interesting eye opening mm -hmm. to like how different these things used to be and how really easy it was to travel through these areas at one point in history. Yeah. And I think this comes with a level of complexity that we as modern readers have to kind of take into account when we're approaching these books, which is that archaeology at this time was very much in a colonial mindset of yeah. like, we, these paternalistic pe people who are more educated than the locals are going to come in and preserve your history for you and whisk it away to the British Museum and you'll never see it again, even though it's like important to you and to your history. And, you know, so Agatha is very much... A part of, of, of this, this machine. machine. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And and she's supporting her husband in his career and he very much has this, you know, I, idea as well, which is not one that we endorse. Um, but it's still as a capsule of history, I think it's really as, interesting. Yeah, if you're interested in just like experiencing like what that was like from that mm -hmm. time period, I think it's a really interesting historical record. Yeah. And I think there is value in that and just like knowing yeah. what, what this world was like while also being like there are like problematic parts of that. Yeah. By the same token, there are a lot of people who would charge Agatha Christie's books with racism or sexism. How do we frame that? Yeah, I so I like did a TikTok video a while ago about Agatha Christie, which is obviously positive because it's me. And someone like commented with a like, oh yeah, she's great, but too bad about all this like sexism and racism. And I was like, sir, <laughs> you have not read her. Because I feel like if you read Agatha Christie as a whole, which, you know, like if you maybe like go in and pick up one book and don't understand the culture she was living in and also like her canon as a yeah. whole, maybe you misread that. There is, I feel like, an issue that we face in our society, and I've, I've seen this said about like Flannery O'Connor and like some other Just writers. Just a shallow, shallow reading approach. Right. If there is a racist character in a book, then the author is racist instead mm -hmm. of like reading the book from the perspective of like, okay, how is this racist character treated? Are they venerated or are they made to be the fool by the end of the story? Mm -hmm. And that is something that repeatedly she does work with and she does like work through to the end. Mm -hmm. And I feel like a lot of people potentially, I, I'm not even sure they finish the novels. They just get to that point and are like, oh, this is racist. And they put it down. And it's mm -hmm. like, that's really immature reading for mm -hmm. me personally to mm -hmm. like not follow through to where is the author taking you with this character because yeah. she does that a lot right and to be honest like her entire Poirot canon yeah is about that because we've right. talked about like what were foreigners in British society right yeah and I think that's really important also like because white is not a race or an ethnicity. White is a movable line that is shifted throughout history. That's why, you know, you could have anti-Semitism. You could have pale European looking people who are considered the outsiders. Right. And, and for the Brits, it was like, oh, you're French? Gross. Right. Yeah. You know? yeah. If you're um, a non-native English speaker, you're a foreigner. I mean, and we can talk about obviously the relationships between the Irish and the Scottish and the Welsh on top of, of that. In, yeah. inside of this little island. Okay. Yeah. We're already dealing with conflict. I mean, and racism. Yeah. So, so if we have like a character that we look at, like Poro, he's from a, in essence, inconsequential nation. He's from Belgium. He is not a native English speaker. He speaks French and he is, has a very thick accent. Sometimes his English is a little questionable. You know, he does not look English. He's very, in their estimation, effeminate because mm -hmm. he's very concerned about his appearance. He's very meticulous. Right. So he like has all of these things that are very 
and antithetical to what British C is good. Mm -hmm. So he is like the opposite of what British C is like the manly character, you mm -hmm. know. And Christy regularly shows how people look down on him just because he's a foreigner, right? right. So to me, like, if Agatha Christie was a racist, would she have made the, like, central character to her entire... Right. She's like, she has 50 Poirot novels. And with we, what we see with Poirot is obviously his intelligence is kind He's of extremely key. intelligent, yeah. But he's also a very tender-hearted person. We don't need to talk about his ending. We both don't like the ending that Christie gave. We're not, we're we're not gonna, dealing We're going to pretend like she didn't write that. Just kidding. Obviously, we have to take that into consideration. But if we look at the Poirot up until... <laughs> The ending that she wrote for him he's a very sensitive person and he's often very kind even to and this comes up with i think murder in mesopotamia where he's dealing with characters or no uh, murder on the orient no uh what's the one where it's also they're traveling murder on the nile Murder on the Nile. Yeah. Thank you. In Murder on There's the Nile. There's a lot of murder on. <laughs> yeah. Murder on the Nile with, with Poirot, um, where he's like dealing with a character who is going through a rough time and he's observing her struggle with her own morality and also struggle with her emotions. And he's very sensitive and empathetic to her, even though he's like watching her kind of go down this path where he would say like, she's about to do that, which is wrong. Right. Yeah. No, he often counsels people from the perspective of like, I want the best for you. Mm -hmm. He's very intuitive to like you know who can be trusted and who can't be and mm -hmm. like honestly like lifting up people when he right. can like Poro is a pretty great character yeah but he is also be in a society that automatically looks down on him yeah and she talks about that regularly that is a plot point in the novels very very regularly where british people just automatically dismiss him yeah. or assume that he's not as intelligent mm -hmm. and then at the very end he comes in and is like actually <laughs> I'm, I'm smarter than all of you. <laughs> yeah, way smarter than all of you. I mean, is, I, you know, Poirot is such a great character. He's very much like a, you know, a Sherlock Holmes in that way, where mm -hmm. he's like the super genius. And I think with a lot of eccentricities and sexualities, yeah, yeah. And I think those characters are always really compelling for an audience. Yeah, and I, I like too that Christie's pretty positive about him because, like, I, I think it's fair to say that she's writing someone with obsessive compulsive disorder before we knew that that was. Yeah. But she doesn't treat it as like a lot of modern writers do and even how like modern movie makers have interpreted Poirot where it's like a depressive thing and yeah. you know, he's so sad he's this way. Poirot is like, I am great. Yeah. This is fat. Yes, I think completely different than you. That's what makes me better than you. Right. You know, like he's not at all depressed about the differences he has like mm -hmm. he celebrates his own differences and i really appreciate that about mm -hmm. her writing you know yeah i honestly just also appreciate like how much she uses him to make fun of british mm -hmm. stereotypes like yeah. there's a scene in like three act tragedy where like at the beginning of the novel he's basically pretending like he can't speak english mm -hmm. so that he can get these british people to just talk around yeah. him and then the end reveals like oh i'm completely fluent and they're yeah. like I thought you were like this stupid foreigner. And he's like, I know you did. I used that against you. <laughs> you know, so it's like, to me, this is not the attitude of someone who's a racist. This is an attitude of someone who's like, hey, Britain, we're being real bad here. Like, yeah. we need to look at our own sensibilities because we look at people who are not really any different than us and say like, oh, yeah, you know, like they're completely unintelligent. Yeah, 100%. So what are some other books where we could get some interesting insights into her views on the complexities of race relations and, and racism and relationships with foreigners? I think actually like Murder on the Mesopotamia is kind of one of my favorites for that in entirely um, because the narrator, like I said, is very different. She is a um, British nurse who's like in her 30s uh, who just kind of ends up by circumstances on this archaeological dig in yeah. Um, Mesopotamia and she is like such a standard British person right mm -hmm. so like she's talking about like oh it's so dirty here and the people you know I totally yeah. understand why people are afraid of these people and you know and then Poirot shows up and she's like oh my god like how are we even gonna deal with this like this is just a foreigner like he's not mm -hmm. you know what what can he possibly do yeah. and then you watch her over the process of it like learn to respect people and learn to you yeah. know appreciate where she is and I feel like the, the novel like ends on this note of like such poignancy because like when it ends she's been back in England for quite some time yeah and she's basically like 
I've come to realize I never felt as alive as I did in this place that I thought was just like this dirty, gross place where right. like civilized people don't live. Yeah. And I've come to realize that's where I felt most alive. Yeah. And so like, I feel like that's my favorite novel when it comes to that. And you know, she obviously comes to the point where she realizes like, oh, the French speaker is smarter than all of us. Right. <laughs> and like, she wants to be his sidekick and be yeah. like, I will help you. Yeah. We will do this together. You know? So like, I feel like there's a really, really fascinating change. It, like the narrator is such a dynamic character that yeah. I feel like that's a really great way to kind of see the progression, while also just being faced with like what like a standard British person would have felt like in that mm -hmm. time era. It's to me that's like kind of my favorite. There's a lot of just like fun moments in stories like um, Five Little Pigs, it's like the three act tragedy, where you have like these. <laughs> Very, like older British men who are like French people am I right you know yeah. and then at the end Poirot being like no you weren't right yeah. <laughs> you know so like the, these things come up a fair amount of times I I will admit like she is not you know a modern person yeah she is still a Victorian and so there are moments where you're like oh I'm yeah we've, income. we've progressed since since, since you yeah. yeah yeah but at the same time like for who she was, like she is born in the Victorian times. Yeah. You know, what she's writing for her time era is mm -hmm. actually quite progressive. Yeah. And especially because she also comes from this sort of like family that is landed. She, her family's kind of like in decline um, before she makes a lot of money. But like this very traditional landed gentry, you know, manor home, which is like she's so interesting about her homes as well. And so you can imagine that formulation of her core identity and her core education and how radical some of her views would be in comparison to what you know, she grew up with what she grew up with also where she was like you know as someone who's married to an archaeologist and so she's living in a very very colonialized mm -hmm. middle east like to still i mean there's been discussions about how like she had some like more anti-semitic stereotypes in her early work mm -hmm. and then after living in the middle east those really disappear from her right. work so like she does also like as a person if you read her work can see how she and changes that's, that's something that i think we see for a lot of british authors who kind of went through world war ii we can even see some of that progress happen with somebody like tolkien too where there's hints of anti-semitism sort of seeded into the the people of the dwarves what and we, then he kind yeah. of is like oh world war ii <laughs> <laughs> We need to renegotiate this and he, re you know, and so again, yeah. people grow and change, but especially when they have a long writing career like that. Well, and she also had just a very long life, you yeah. know, and, and I think that it's perfectly reasonable for you to like, if you are born entrenched in this culture to have a growing period where yeah. you're, you mature in your views and especially the upheaval yeah. of world history that she lived through basically from like her very start of adulthood all the way to the yeah. end. Like it is an incredible period that she is living mm -hmm. through. Yeah. So somebody like Poirot, he really deals with issues around, or, or ha she uses him as a tool to confront our British attitudes around foreigners, but she does also use him, as you said, to sort of confront toxic mas masculinity as well in sort of British this perception of this, I'll give you a pair of fives, yeah. you know, I'm a, I'm a robust man. But even more so, we have a character like Miss Marple, who's really taking head on some gender stereotypes. Right. So, like, that's when I say, like, both of her main characters that are the biggest parts of her canon kick back against British society. Because much like foreigners are seen as, like, you know, the worst mm -hmm. in British society, elderly single woman who never fulfilled, like, the womanly duties of marriage and motherhood mm -hmm. are also similar seen as, like, kind of castaways in the society because, mm -hmm. like what use were you yeah. like you just were here and you know didn't you never fulfilled your womanhood so like right we don't respect these people we don't see them as intelligent we don't see them as like valuable yeah and what does christy do she makes this the smartest person in the room right. again yeah you know miss marple is you know she's still very much a victorian woman mm -hmm. she still like dresses like a victorian she does her knitting while sitting back and being like oh sweetheart <laughs> so wrong <Yeah. laughs> okay so what are some good books that you would suggest for readers who are looking for more of this commentary on sort of gender stereotypes i think one of my favorite moments um i believe it was in dumb witness which let's take a moment to say like she wrote dumb witness so that she could make her dog like her actual dog one of the main characters and then insisted that the publishers put her dog on the cover 
One of the many reasons I like this woman. But anyway, dumb witness. Well, I should say we're both like hardcore dog people. Serious so, dog yeah. people. This is important. Um, yeah. And she was as well. Which, yeah. One more reason I love her. But anyway, in Dumb Witness, there's this moment where this elderly woman is like serving drinks to the men in the room as mm-hmm. the woman. And like the youngest man in the room was like, oh, no, no, whiskey's not healthy. You know, I just want to drink some water. And she like gets all internally flared up because what kind of man is like this? What kind of man turns down manly drinks? You know, and she starts going into like, oh, my father never yeah. would have. My father would have been like a man's man and all these yeah. things. Right. And then later on in the story, you find out that. Her father was like a knockdown, drag out drunk. And she and her sisters spent their lives building a mythology around their father to hide from the community how awful he was. Mm. And she's just basically like bought into this mythology of who men should be, even though her father actually was like a horrible person. Mm-hmm. And then you find out this young man who's like, whiskey's not for me, is a really nice person who's very valuable in right. society. And so I like when I read that, I was like, that's like really head on toxic masculinity in like the 1930s yeah you know it's like not where I expected to find that yeah and I think too for like for someone like Christy you know I, I think she really operates well on on two levels which is one the mystery is great so if you want to read her just for the plot then you totally can and have a wonderful time with yes. it but she does have these deeper social commentaries that are threaded through her works and I think that's probably the key we were talking about this earlier that some of these issues are harder. They don't come necessarily to the surface until you're reading a lot of her books. Yeah, I feel like for me, because I had a period in my life when I was younger where I just read her on and off. And then um, a couple of years ago, I really started to just like go through her books one after another. Mm-hmm. And when I was reading her that way, that's when I started to notice like the social commentary yeah. that she was doing. And she was hitting certain notes over and over again and making points that I didn't really expect. But I'm not sure I really would have noticed them if I had stayed on the path of like, read this one and this and like a year later, read that one. You know, like I feel like the process of just like sitting down and reading through, like I didn't read through her entire canon in, in like one shot, but I kind of got close. <laughs> um, that like helped me read her better Mm -hmm. you know and also she's just very readable so it's kind of just easy i was reading them on audible you can get them on the library um both libby and overdrive and hoopla hoopla has them all available immediately i'm just gonna throw that out there but it is she is so readable it's very easy to just finish one and put another one on and keep going and, and just thoroughly enjoy the whole way through also i feel like this is something that you can grasp more in rereads because and the first read of it, often we're just like, okay, who did it? Like, wait, yeah. what? No, is that a clue? Is that a clue? You know, and you yeah. just get very caught up in the mystery. And so that's one of the reasons I love to go back and reread them. Often I realize how humorous they are in the second round. There's a lot of things that you pick up on the, in the first round. You're like, get a little bit lost in trying to decide what is and is not a clue. Uh, this is one of the reasons I feel like they are highly rereadable, even if you already know what the mystery is. Mm-hmm. Um, just there's so many little things in there that are easy to pick up on the second read. Yeah. One thing that I did want to talk about before we wrap up our conversation about the lovely Agatha Christie is sort of the structure of her works. And one of the things that really struck me, the first book that I ever read was Murder on the Orient Express, which has been adapted to film multiple Multiple times. times. And I think so many of her works, and that one is a prime example, are adaptable to film because they really work well in this sort of three act structure. And maybe that's something that for this golden age mystery, right, it's part of that classic mystery where you have to have like sort of like the setup and the murder and who are all of your suspects nice. and then the investigation and maybe a twist or a second murder and then the reveal at the end like lends itself to that structure really well. And so perhaps that's part of why Agatha Christie was so prolific as she you know, not always, but frequently used this structure and did variations within it. I, th- I think mapping her books, like doing a big spreadsheet and mapping, you know, the <laughs> movements and the yeah. turns and the, and the, and, and trying to put it into this three act structure and seeing what works and what doesn't. I'm always interested in the structure of a book would be a really interesting case study, but I think you can also see the ways in which she, her, her writing style an approach just really she's a playwright also and I just see that yeah. influence so strongly in the way that she writes and also maybe it's because you're you're interviewing characters you're trying to get evidence I'm not exactly sure but there's sort of like this delectable confluence of elements that just make her really really well adapted for the stage or for the screen 
Yeah, and well, um, Golden Age mysteries do have like a lot of times a structure, and there are some times where she completely throws that structure out of the window and goes for it, like things like, and then there was none. Yeah. Um, but a lot of Golden Age mysteries do have that structure of the detective, the suspects, you know, murder one, murder two, you know, that sort of thing. I think she perfects that more than any other author and like finds a way to make that, you know, viable in so many different aspects. I think another thing that makes her so adaptable to film is that so many of her stories are based on small communities. Mm -hmm. And so there's a very limited number of characters. There's a very limited like set in and mm -hmm. of itself. It's often a house or, yeah. you know, a village, but like three houses in that village. And so I think that they are much more manageable to produce yeah, as and films and shows. aren't super long either, which no. makes it more makes them you you can adapt them easier without having to you know cut out huge pieces of it mm -hmm. which would just you know spiral the story out of control if you because like she's very like there's nothing in her books there are yeah, wasted a, yeah a very concise writer it's yeah true i'd never really thought about it yeah everything is there for a reason mm -hmm. and they're often like something like you know the murder of roger Ackroyd, where she gets to the end and she's basically like here's all the things that you should have picked up on and you're just like Oh, I should have picked up on that. You know? <laughs> yeah, because like for her, there's nothing that's wasted. Yeah. So, as a final question, favorite Agatha Christie? Well, I've already talked about mur um, Murder in Mesopotamia. That's definitely one of mine. Another really big favorite of mine is Crooked House, um, which does not have any of her detectives in it. Her usuals. She does have actually a couple of different ones that show up regularly, but no Poirot, no um, Miss Marple, anything. It's a post. World War II novel, and it primarily takes place in one house with one family. It's very creepy. The ending was like kind of shocking to me, mm -hmm. um, especially for her and yeah. how it ends. So yeah, I I absolutely love that one. It's just very much like, and yeah. on it, actually that is actually one of her two favorites. Yeah, she lists her favorites as Crooked House and Ordeal of Innocence by Innocence. Interesting. We do have on the docket Ordeal by Innocence coming in a future episode. Yes, we're excited about this. Yeah. My personal favorite is Death Comes at the End, and this is her only, as you've told me, I haven't read all of her books, but apparently it's her only historical novel. Yes. Um, and this is actually set in ancient Egypt. So unlike some of her other archaeology novels that are set in modern time at an exactly. ar archaeology site exactly. or in the Middle East somewhere or something like that, this is actually historical and your characters live, they're ancient Egyptians living in ancient Egypt. And a, this novel does contain murder in it, but... It seems to me to be less of a murder mystery and more of a family novel in which murder has occurred. Right. And it's more so about the family dynamics and how that shifts the way that the relationships in the family um, are shifted because of what has occurred in the family and the power dynamics between the fathers and the sons, or the father and the sons, and then he has a new wife and how that affects the relationship yeah. with the daughters and the other women in the Because it's house. a very patriarchal society, but yeah. then women in this group are extremely impactful on how the right. men behave amongst each other. And so it's a really interesting look, all set to a backdrop of like, you don't usually see that as a yeah. historical novel. Yeah. Most historical novelists do not choose something that far removed. But yeah. of course she's living in the, you know, the study of ancient Egypt mm -hmm. for a huge part of her life. And I, she's very well informed. Extremely so. well informed. Yeah. I, someone noted that she was like, as far as like female historians, like the most knowledgeable woman on this particular history in England, just because like basically just being around it so much. And mm -hmm. I feel like she was just like, I need to get these things out of my head yeah. and put them somewhere. Yeah. And so anyway, that's my favorite. And if you're looking for something a little bit, I mean, it's really off the beaten path for her in so yes. many ways. Yes. Um, it's so unique and it's just really a, f a fascinating story. Yeah. Yeah. I would, that's definitely kind of those ones where it's like, you've read a lot of her more famous ones, like Murder on the Orient Express, you know, um, and then there were none like yeah. these things that center so focused on, on England and English people and English society. And then you jump into that one and it's just like, is this the same writer? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. So that's, I think, pretty much it that we have for you guys today. If you have a favorite Agatha Christie show, sure. please share sure. in the comments or send us an email. We'll have our email and contact information down below. Or if you have any questions about Agatha Christie that we can answer for you, we'd love to do that on We're our next episode. Always willing to talk more about Agatha Christie. Yeah. And like I said, we'll have links down below in the show notes slash in the description box with some of the books that we mentioned today and our favorites and that biography that I recommended. 
Um, Another fun biography. Yeah. It's not going to be anywhere like as complex as the one you're mentioning, but there is a like kind of like a mini biography called um, "The Life and Crimes of Agatha Christie" that goes through each one of her books mm-hmm. and tells you where she was in her life oh, at the time yeah. she wrote it. It's by Charles Osborne, who's very close to her family mm-hmm. and like has been the person who's translated some of her plays into novel form. Mm-hmm. And it just was like kind of a fun way to like like connect her books to her life and why she maybe was talking about that subject at that time. That sounds really interesting. Okay, we'll definitely link that one down below as well. And until next time, we hope you enjoy your novels and your tea. (laughs) This is Alexandra and Emily signing off.